and welcome to Autosave. I'm Camille Salzer Hadaway, and I'm here with my co host, Mr. Nick Andrade. On today's episode, we are continuing our trek through Fimble Winter in God of War Ragnarok. On last week's episode, I need you to know you can trust me. And if I'm going to help you take this to the end, I need to be able to trust you. And trust is earned. I get it. Take this, figure out the rest of it. If you're staying, that is. You're going to tell me what you're really looking for in there. Translate that, and I'll tell you everything. And on that, young man, you can trust me. So after stumbling across Charlie Freya's tortoise house that she abandoned and left to freeze, horrible, by the way, Atreus had a moment to reflect on what was the best next step for him in order to save his father from Kratos' ill-fated prophecy. He chose the path of least resistance, and that meant going with Hugin to Asgard. The thing is, Hugin left him outside of the walls of Asgard, where he met mortals that Odin saved from Thimblewinter. After a brief conversation with them and boasting about being Odin's apprentice, Atreus climbed a ginormous wall and met Heimdall at its peak. Now, Heimdall has a whole Shrek Prince Charming thing going on, but not in a good way. And we also learned that Heimdall really could read people's minds and intentions before things happen, which makes it really hard to attack him, which we did when we got into a little fight with him. However, the fight was interrupted by Odin and Thor, who were pretty upset with Heimdall kind of treating Atreus, who Odin said is his guest. After that, we got the whole Asgardian tour from Odin and we met Lady Sif, who's still upset over the death of her sons at the hands of Kratos and Atreus. And we met Thrud, who is Thor's daughter and oddly isn't as upset as her mother. We found out that Odin wants us to help him unlock secrets to a realm terror and recover pieces of a mysterious mask that has words engraved on it that only Atreus is able to translate for some reason. We then set out with Thor to Muspelheim to find a piece of the mask. And while we distract Thor with the trials, Atreus sneaks off to Surtur's shrine and sees Angraboda. From there, they learn that the prophecy of Surtur means that he has to combine to create a new entity. And we also learn that his marble is empty, which hints and gives us hope that he's still alive. After saying our goodbyes to Angraboda, we head back to find Thor and with our piece of the mask, go back to Asgard. We covered quite a bit um, the last episode, Nick. There was a lot going on, a lot more mystery thrown into the equation that is God of War Ragnarok. And I'm kind of curious to see what's going to happen as we dive into today's episode, where we figure out what fate has in store for us in chapter nine and chapter 10. But first, Nick. Yeah. Let's talk because there's been a lot of whispers about a live action God of War. We know that there is a series in the making, but I'm curious to know who would you cast as the different characters in God of War Ragnarok? I say we do this together instead of giving yeah. separate lists. So let's start off with the one and only the God of War himself, Kratos. Oh my goodness. I wasn't prepared for this question, but I know that you're a big proponent of actually using Christopher Judge as Kratos, but I'm trying to think of like someone who's like bulky and a good actor that could play. Dave Batista. Dave Batista did cross my mind. I'm going to say, though, Idris Elba is my choice. Ah, yes. That's a good one. Ah, that's actually a really good one. I think you can play it really well and, and the like. His voice, he could get definitely get it very low, and that would be my choice. Oh, that's a good choice. I'm gonna still stick with Christopher Judge on this one, but it just Elba isn't a bad one at all. Uh, let's you. talk about Atreus though. Yes, that's our other protagonist we play as. This one's really hard because all I think about is the person who actually plays Atreus, Sunny. And I have no one else in mind, which is horrible. Well, I don't think it's horrible. It's like, I don't think we know relatively how many like kid actors there are right now. 
and they kind of just pop up out of nowhere, right? Sunny would be the good choice for Atreus, teenage Atreus. But if they're going back to like 2018 God of War to start, then it wouldn't make sense. Because I think yeah, it would be too... because he's older now. Yes. Unless, again, they want to go a route where Atreus is a little bit older in the first one. And then the second one, he's like an adult. Which I don't know. I don't really know if that would work properly. But, I mean, child actors today working right now... I couldn't name one of them. Like, are Dylan and Cole Sprouse, are they still available <laughs> as children? Child actors, let's, okay, the kid from Stranger Things. Which kid? The main kid. No, but they're like 20 years old now. I know, I know, but isn't it in Hollywood, like 20-year-olds or 25-year-olds are playing like teenagers? So yes. it works. Oh, well, that's even the one kid actor I knew, which is Jacob Tremblay, he's 16 now. I don't think 16 is too old. I mean, honestly, looking at his pictures now, he, he could definitely be Atreus. He looks a little different now. So, you know what? I'm going to say Jacob Tremblay. Look him up. All right. He's in the room with Brie Larson, and that's where he got his uh, fame. He's also in Luca. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. You know what? Let's stick to that casting. I like that. Okay. I like that one. All right. To finish off the trio of like the main characters we're always with, we have to talk about Mimir. Ooh. Who is going to play the <laughs> the all-knowing head that is Mimir? I think I have a good one for this one. Hugo Weaving. Oh, that's good. I like that. Who, who's your pick? I think this is a better choice than Hugo Weaving. Gary Oldman. What? Gary Oldman? Gary Oldman would be a great Mimir. But like Gary Oldman doesn't have that ruggish look. That Mimir has. Ruggish. He literally is serious black. <laughs> he, I guess so. Okay, fine. Fine. Wait, but like we, we didn't mention Freya, and I think Angelina Jolie would be the perfect Freya. What? Actually, yeah. I could see that. That would work, right? Angelina, yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Like she's old enough that you know she has a grown son, Balder, right? Yeah. I think that would be perfect. Perfect. That casting. makes sense. Okay. A plus casting from Nick. <laughs> I don't I still am not sure. I think Hugo Weaving is a better choice from Mimir, but it's okay. It's okay. When was the last time Hugo Weaving did anything of, of relevance? We got an Oscar Award winner, Gary Oldman. Yeah, but Hugo Weaving, that's why he's so cool. He doesn't care. He doesn't give two ishes. Right. So like I would I would just love to see him here. It's kind of like, you know, in Captain America. When we saw it was Hugo Weaving, we're like, oh dang. We right. forgot about him, but he's so good at what he does. Anyways, let's talk about the gods. Let's go in to God realm with Odin. So Odin, you know what? Oh my goodness. I don't even know who's old right now. Anthony Hopkins? <laughs> old actors. No, <laughs> he played He played Odin in the <laughs> Oh, he did. He did. Play Thor. Odin. Yeah. Old actors right now is what I'm typing. Richard Schiff. Danny is DeVito. The one. Danny DeVito. Danny no, DeVito. not Danny. You can't know. <laughs> not Danny DeVito. Please. We're going to go with my casting just because not Danny DeVito. Richard Schiff is Odin. Okay. Let's talk Thor. Who's Thor? Maddie Matheson. No, that's... that's <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. And what about Kevin Smith? I'm just I'm just naming like <laughs> chubby actors. I'm so bad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Josh Brolin? No, because I feel like he's done. You know what? He, I, Josh Brolin could, could hit it, I think. I think he'd do really well. And now it was not Kevin Smith I was talking about. It was Kevin James, by the way. Kevin James. You know, you know who should play Thor? Who? Ryan Hurst, who plays Thor in God of War Ragnarok already. Ryan but you Hurst? may remember him from um, Sons of Anarchy. Oh my God, yes. He literally looks like Thor. Holy shit. He is Thor in he the game. He has a beard and long hair. Okay, it's yeah. got to be this guy, Ryan Hurst, 100%. Yeah. Love it. Let's talk Angraboda. The person that comes to my mind, Storm Reed. Oh, Storm Reed would be really, really good. I'm, I'm on board with Storm Reed. And Stormy kind of looks like Anger Boda in the game. Yeah. I'm actually surprised that they didn't ask her for the rights to her face. Right. It's like the whole thing with Elliot Page and Ellie, and Ellie yeah. from The Last of Us. They do look alike. But Stormy's 100% on board for that. 
Let's talk Brock and Sindri because like these two are a pair. Yeah. I think Simon Pegg, because he's really good at bickering. Yeah. I think he would be a good Sindri and then Toby Jones would be the Brock. I have a perfect casting here, but I got to look their names up. Also, I just remembered like Andy Serkis may actually be a good Mimir. I have Brock and Sindri would be Frodo Baggins and Samwise Gamgee would be <laughs> Sean Astin and Elijah Wood. Elijah Wood would be Sindri and Sean Astin would be Brock. I think that could work. You're just trying to make a Lord of the Rings. No, I'm not. I, just, I think they would be great together. They have chemistry. It would work really well. They could be like brothers. All right, then. Well, let us know what you think of our fan castings. I think we actually did pretty well with this. We could pretty much make a movie ourselves. That's the thing. It's like it's going to be a TV show. So all of these castings are probably not going to happen because they're like all movie stars. Yeah, it'll be pretty pricey. It will. Sure. Yeah, that would be like more than the budget of the actual show is my guess. Well, you know what? You don't need a big budget to play God of War Ragnarok. And that's what no. we're going to do. We're going to continue diving into the game, starting with Chapter 9, The World of Fate. The Nords. You found them once. Could you do so again? I could try, but I don't see how that they would help. They are the fates of these lands, are they not? I would know what they know. You may not find them cooperative. As long as I find them. So Kratos plans to find the fate of Norse mythology, which is the Norns. Now, if you remember and if you played the previous God of War games, we know that Kratos does not have a good, good luck with fates. I mean, it usually ends bloody. Yes. So hopefully it won't this time around because he's older, he's wiser, he's less violent, but he is also very desperate to find his son. And I think that's kind of pushing him to the brink of doing things that he wouldn't otherwise do like we hear him talk to atreus about prophecy and he doesn't really believe that or doesn't want to focus on that but yet he's seeking out the norns who are all telling of the future and he's looking to what they see to be correct so if kratos here is kind of being led astray by his own desperation this game so far i really notice a change in kratos not necessarily that he, you know, he still protects his own. And you know, obviously we get through some bloody melee and fighting. But to me, I still think we're still getting a reserved Kratos here that regardless of whatever happens with his son, and I know I don't think it's going to drive him into badness, whatever it is. I think he really has learned to kind of temper his anger and kind of just be more reasonable and whatever it is. And again, he only does things if someone else attacks, he attacks back, so et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think like if he doesn't get the right answers from the Norns that he's going to go ham on them. Oh, no, no, so, no. I don't think that as well. My whole thing is that he is looking to the Norns for answer. Usually Kratos, because he doesn't believe in the whole prophecy of everything. That's true, yeah. He wouldn't look to the Norns that supposedly see the future. He would actually speak against it about him making his own future, you know, um, not being overcome by what is supposed to be. So I think in that sense, he is kind of losing his grasp on himself, which is understandable mm. because, I mean, he he's lost his son right now and he's trying to figure out what's going on. So I think the, the fact that he's so desperate to just find Atreus, he's willing to even go through a lens of prophecy. I understand. That makes sense. So he's desperate. He's desperate for yes. answers. So he'll go to, even if he doesn't believe in the Norns, he still wants to go. I understand. Yeah, exactly. So with that in mind, we head to Midgard and go to find Kratos's wolves and set them up on uh, the sleigh. Now, this is a really cute moment because you hear Freya bring a softness when interacting with the wolves, whereas Kratos is like more short tempered and strict with them. And throughout this chapter, you find little nods to this for Kratos to kind of learn how to appreciate his wolves like they are a part of the family, which I really like. I uh, 
when we let them loose, I had to go grab my headphones because my dog was going crazy whenever he heard these wolves uh, barking. <laughs> so that was the only thing because I would play like, let's say like at 11 or midnight or something like that. And he was like fast asleep and then he would hear the barking and he'd be like, what's going on? What's that? Who's there? And I was like, don't worry. It's just a video game, but he doesn't understand that. But I think it's really cute to see the dogs again. Be, or they're not the dogs. They are wolves. I don't know. I'm calling them dogs. But it's nice to kind of like, I was like thinking, are we going to let them starve? <laughs> but we see them again. I, I feel like they would just go hunting themselves. Like they've been just chilling that little piece of log, laying back, waiting for Kratos in a trace <laughs> to return. Like they're really cool wolves. Speaking of them, we do go on the sleigh. We attach them there. And then we're heading into the Lake of Nine with Freya. And Kratos and Freya have this back and forth. We've now have filled Freya in on Kratos's death prophecy. And we learn that Kratos isn't conflicted with his potential demise. He's more conflicted with the fact that he doesn't understand why Faye wanted him to see his own death, this prophecy, which he's hinted to this. I think we've kind of known this was the issue, but he never we never heard anyone vocalize it like a Freya does. And Kratos quickly says, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Mm. I mean, I, I could understand where he's coming from because usually I feel like if anyone knew I was going to die, I wouldn't want to know about it. Right. Because that ad adds a certain level of stress. So yeah. like, why do you think fate wanted him to know? I don't, I don't think he's afraid of death necessarily though. I think he's ready for it. Everything that we've heard from him so far in this game, he's trying to like, you know, make Atreus ready for for whenever that time comes. And that was his whole purpose. Like, I'm still kind of like at a loss at what Faye entirely wants in this situation and what's going on, especially with the flashbacks and whatnot. I don't know if we're going to learn more about Faye or maybe she pops up at the end of the game, but I don't know. But Kratos is... I know he doesn't want to talk about it, but I think I think he has accepted it at this point, even though he keeps talking about not believing in prophecy. And I think there's a small part in him that is like, this is going to happen. I think he is afraid of death, but not for the usual reasons like people would be afraid that of death. That makes sense. Yeah. He's afraid of death because he feels like he doesn't have enough time to prepare Atreus. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, usually... I feel like parents want to see their kids go into adulthood. For Trace, he's yeah. still a kid, right? So I think from that perspective, he still has so much to prepare himself for. As we see, like he's still immature. He still is naive a bit and doesn't really think sh with his head on straight. Whereas Kratos is more level head more level headed sometimes he sometimes, gets really yeah. upset <laughs> then things go crazy but he needs time to prepare Atreus for this and I think how everything is coming to be and this prophecy slowly being fulfilled it's kind of like that it's ticking down the clock's kind of, kind of coming down on Kratos where he's has to face the potential that he may die um, sooner than he thought. Well, I hope not because I'm banking on him staying alive for the entire game. And if he does die, then I'm never playing this game again. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be a God of War game. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So we arrive at the Lake of Nine and our wolves use their scent to help track down the Norns, which is really cool because obviously they just have that ability to <laughs> just sniff them out. And they lean their head left or right. And then that's how you have to navigate the sleigh by just following their lead. This is just really cute. I liked it. I'm all for anything with these wolves. They are adorable. They lead you to one area and you have to fight this org and some raiders along. But even after defeating them, unfortunately, it leads to a dead end. This happens a couple of times. And there's a few side missions that you could do because you have the Lake of Nine accessible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. throughout. But we're not we're going to talk about the side missions in the last part of this episode. I'm going to continue on with the story because after you finally face against the frost grow near and a traveler that's when you know that you're on the path to the norns 
let's just say as well, those two enemies, they're difficult. They are very difficult. But what I found more difficult in this whole thing was I didn't know, I didn't understand the wolf mechanic in terms of- Really? Yes, I it, I had to search it because a while I just kept going in circles and circles. And then I didn't realize that you had to follow the scent through like if they lean left or right. Because I, again, I think I was, wasn't was paying attention to what Freya was saying. So I kind of spent like a half an hour on this in frustration, not knowing what to do until I looked it up. and be like, I'm such an idiot that it was so obvious. But whatever. <laughs> I can't believe you missed it. It is pretty obvious because the screen does pause. It does. And uh, icon on the side shows up to say follow the wolves no but i know it says follow the wolves but i didn't understand what that meant like what do you mean follow the wolves i'm the one leading this pack (laughs) and i didn't understand that they were leaning left or right i was like oh you're the alpha dog of this pack amazing well don't do what nick did follow the wolves and then you're gonna start to hear whispers and we find out that those are the norns trying to play with your mind and you'll encounter a frost phantom this means you are pretty much at the door of the norms and you will see a door when there's that itchy sound again normally i don't mind ladies whispering in my ear but this is positively awesome anyone ever tell you that you babble when you're terrified terrified i'll have you know i'm at the very most deeply apprehensive and breaking tension with humor is the sacred duty of a traveling companion how very dare you babbling the door. Oh, that looks official. Mother. My boy. Everything. Walter, listen to me, please. Stop! Why did you bring him here? You are not welcome here. Wait! Walter, come back! So as Kratos goes to use the chisel to unlock the door, Freya hears Balder and sees herself kind of trying to protect Balder and pleading to him. It gets very foggy and she runs into the fog. We're ambushed by a bunch of enemies. And this to me just has mystical eyes norns written all over it they're all seeing they're all knowing they're pretty much trying to stop us from seeing them freya did say that they would not make it easy and they are definitely playing a lot of mind games i don't like it i you know what there's a lot there's a lot of games that have these like foggy like vision don't know what's happening type of like missions and then they show like visions and they try to like mess you up. Like I've seen it in Batman. Uh, we did it with Arkham Knights before as well. Like it always turns into something creepy. Freya and Kratos have has so much baggage. Yeah. That uh, they could really probably get manipulated by all this Norn tomfoolery. Yeah. And you know, like for Freya, she's so strong and Kratos as well. But even in her friendship with Kratos, like you hear her speak to this vision and says hey why are you with him like he's the reason Uh your son's dead and freya says like no it was an accident like he didn't need to (laughs) kind of thing so you're right like they could completely be (laughs) manipulated by this as you could tell like freya is still hurting um and you never really know what would be that point or what will actually make them lose their mind in a sense especially like they just made up and now, you know, Freya has to see Balder again. I'm sure that doesn't help mm. the relationship. <laughs> Definitely not. But you know what? Freya is not the only one that's having mind games played on her. We also see Mimir that is back in the tree and cries to Kratos to save him. But then he hears a familiar voice, Sigrun, who blames him for serving Odin. So Sigrin, if you can't remember, is Mimir's love interest. And you know that there was a huge history here with them because, well, Mimir did a lot of bad things when he was serving Odin and kind of destroyed that relationship. And while Kratos is defeating Sigrin, we see Mimir get sucked into the tree and an explosion happens that 
has Kratos fall to the ground. And when he gets up again, he sees Atreus running into the fog while also saying, Father, help me, monster. Um, I love the amb- <laughs> the fog just brings like broken sentences with characters, making it all more mysterious. The funny thing is with this is at first you do think that Atreus is asking for your help. But then at the end of fighting a few enemies, you actually catch up with Atreus and you find out that he's actually pleading to the All Father to help him get away from Kratos. This is really eye opening to see Kratos's doubts as being a father. I know like he is very fixated on making sure that his mistakes aren't repeated through Atreus, but I didn't know he was concerned so much that Atreus would look to Odin as that father figure. I don't think it's necessarily father figure, but I think it's more so that he's afraid that because he's a half giant and because he, you know, his name is Loki and he has this, all this like weight on his shoulders that he's going to run to Odin, stay with Odin, and he's going to forget about Kratos. Maybe that has to do with fatherhood. I'm not sure. I don't think he's afraid of how he's treated Atreus, but I just think that he's afraid that everything he's taught Atreus is going to go out the window and he's just going to follow this prophecy and stick with Odin somehow. And then he has failed as a father in that sense. But I think his general insecurity comes from him failing his first wife and his daughter and i think that weighs heavily on him that he doesn't want to make the same mistakes with atreus now Faye has already passed away he doesn't want to lose another child the one thing like we saw this too in like alfheim when he was doing we were doing side quests and he was saying like i just want to keep doing these things like this is the things that i remember fun whatever just being with you, Atreus. Like, I think he's just worried about losing him because he doesn't want to lose someone yeah. he loves again because it's it's been so much heartbreak for him throughout his life. Yeah, and he doesn't want to repeat history, right? That's what it comes down to. We see Kratos trying to be a different type of god, be more thoughtful rather than mm-hmm. rushing in to a fight as the answer. The way I just saw it is that a father figure usually is able to offer you some advice, some wisdom, some knowledge to guide you down a path. Unfortunately, because Kratos is also lost in the mystery of everything, this prophecy, seeing his death, understanding why Faye or the lack of understanding of why Faye wanted to show him this, he doesn't have those answers. And we've seen him get frustrated up until this point when he gets into fights with Atreus and Atreus mentions Faye, he's frustrated with her because he doesn't have the answers he wants to have in order to give that advice to Atreus to be that father figure so he doesn't look for answers elsewhere. And I think when he looks at Odin, he knows that Odin may be able to give him those answers because he is the all father. And I think he is a little bit afraid that because of that knowledge Odin has, Atreus may actually side with Odin, not knowing that he's building that bond with Odin that may go against Kratos and may actually make that prophecy come true. My my one concern, like I don't think like Odin's a manipulator and a master manipulator, and all we've heard of in, in the last you know two games yeah. is how much he manipulates. So I don't think he's worried that that Odin's going to be a better father necessarily, as in terms of he's just going to brainwash Atreus. If and that's his fear of always trying to like, he's always like I remember in the first scene of the of the game he's just like what did he say to you what did Odin talk about with you I think he's worried about that he doesn't want Atreus to be influenced by Odin and his lies I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, we could definitely agree that Kratos wants to keep Atreus and Odin as far as possible from each uh, yeah, other. Away. But after we have this nightmarish trip, we find ourselves in the Well of Erd and we see a horse that's called Kelpie. Freya asks Kelpie to take us to the Norns and she does by walking on water and literally transforming and then becoming like this underwater vessel <laughs> to take us to a cave. This was such a cool scene. So 
freaking cool. I, I love just getting on this Kelpie. I was like, what's happening here? And it was so unlike yeah. anything I've ever seen in this game. And I was like, this is so, so, so cool. And, the, and then just the graphics looked amazing. Yeah, it was like so magical and fantastical. Like it was just like, I, firstly, I was I just thought we were going to walk across the water and then we'd find like the Norns. <laughs> but then it just like the the horse like Kelby bucks and like lifts itself up. And then just these like, I guess it's seaweed comes out from different way i don't know different like parts of it oh it's like the main the main of it the main of the horse right it's like kelp it's like kelp yeah it's like kelp yeah and then yeah. goes underwater i thought that was such a cool way to visualize that and then when you actually reach the cave and go underwater the cool thing here is that kelpie looks different than yes. she did when we met her at the well of erd um she just what? has like this cool like coloring and kind of like a white pale but then mixed in with like this aquamarine blue i just like that attention to detail that's the kind of god shit i like to see well we finally meet the norns and we're at their doorstep kratos freya and mimir's head enter the home of the norns tentatively They have finally reached their destination. Kratos speaks first. I, I seek, seek my, my son. son. <laughs> you know the child is an Asgard. No, you see what all who search for us seek. To know the ending to your story. You will die, Kratos of Sparta. But you called him the destroyer of fate. There, there must be a way, way to, to subvert, subvert destiny. destiny. There is no destiny, Puck. The protagonists are speechless. They do not understand. There is no grand design, no script. Only the choices you make. That your choices are so predictable. Merely make us seem prescient. You are the sum of your choices, nothing more. And because your choices never change, you will learn that Heimdall intends to kill your son in Asgard, and you will do what you do best. And then Ragnarok. The skies burn, the curtains fall. Exunt on me. Heimdall. <laughs> Again, he misses the point. Focusing on the second act to the exclusion of the final. A common mistake in Storycraft. We are yeah, leaving. leaving. So we meet Uro, Verandi, and Skuld. And these are unlike the fates in Greek mythology. The fates are very old. Mm. Whereas the Norns, they, they come in different ages. Uh, we have like the more senior one, which is Euro, and then Verandi and Skuld are the younger ones. Yeah. And they love teasing freya and kratos this was for me like i wish there was a boss fight here because i wanted to fight these fates <laughs> wait, wait you wanted to fight them more because they were teasing or just you thought it would be a cool fight no because they were so annoying and they were making fun of kratos and i was like let me at him i'm gonna defend my buddy kratos here like this is unacceptable because they were they, i wouldn't even call it teasing they were straight up like disrespecting them yeah, Skald was the disrespecting one. Skald oh, yeah. would just pop out out of nowhere behind Kratos, behind Freya, and just copy the lines. And I'm just like, ooh, this is taking me back to like elementary school. You know when your friends would just mock you by saying the same things? No, I'm so sorry. Were you bullied? Do we want to talk about it? <laughs> Wait, maybe they weren't my friends. Oh, maybe no. I was bullied. Oh, I'm so oh. sorry. We're opening oh, up a can of worms here. I know this this game has been opening cans of worms for our entire lives. Uh, but yeah, like, you know, that mocking game where it's like, oh, I'm going to annoy you. I'm going to say yeah, exactly yeah. the same thing me, you me, do. Me, 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 me. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. This took me back to that. And yeah, I wanted to punch Skuld in the face multiple See, times. There you go. Well. You understand why I wanted a boss fight here. Yeah. Now I understand. I understand. The emotions 
are bringing me back to like just wanting to fight. Yes, I do understand. But they have this interesting discussion because they let us know that Atreus is in Asgard and they say that Kratos already knew this. We never heard Kratos say that Atreus was in Asgard. We never, but I guess he always had that going through his mind as we saw in the vision. He was thinking of Odin. He was thinking of Atreus being with Odin. I'm curious to why he, like, do you think it's obvious that he would do that? Because to me, it wasn't obvious. Like, if I was just a character in this world, along with Kratos, like, if I was at Sindri's house, I wouldn't automatically think that Atreus was in Asgard, because I think he would be smarter than that. I mean, that's where my mind would have gone after the fight that they had. Not necessarily like when, you know, Atreus is, like, sneaking out at night and trying to, like, find other shrines or whatever that is but after a fight like that you would think your child would be like okay well if they don't appreciate what i'm trying to do then i'm gonna go to asgard and see odin so i think if i'm a father in that situation like if i get into a fight with my son like that and then he all he obviously leaves and there's some sort of you know story plot surrounding around you know him going to asgard that's probably where my mind goes right away and so when he hears it from the Norns, I think he like that kind of just solidifies that he knows that that's what's happened. Yeah, for sure. I see what you're saying now. The Norns also say that Heimdall plans on killing Atreus and that Kratos will do what he does best because they keep telling him that he is a god killer. This is what he does. Even though he thinks he's changed, that's who he is. And that had me really think to everything that Kratos has been doing, really, you know, we want to say that Kratos has changed his mindset. He seems more level-headed, but really his actions haven't shown anything different. He still looks to a fight, not necessarily as the first answer, but always ends up being there. So can you really escape fate? He doesn't go looking for the fights, but on this journey, it just happens because people either want to kill him or fight him, or whatever the hell it is. So it just keeps happening. And he's he's not going to back down from a fight. I don't know. Like, this prophecy makes a lot of sense. So, like, Kratos is almost battling, you know, he knows that he's going to have to defend his son. And if he's defending his son, he's probably going to have to kill some gods. And if he kills some gods, i.e. Heimdall, then it's probably going to start Ragnarok. So I think he's really battling with this point. It's like, how do I stop this prophecy from happening and what these norns are saying like we know you so well because they basically they're talking in terms of like they i remember the beginning of 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 the cutscene. they're like they're they're saying exactly what freya and kratos says and it's not because they know what they're going to say through prophecies because they can read them so well almost like what heimdall can do as well where it's like we can we know what you're going to say because you you we know your personality so well so it's like how do i battle that and like stop this prophecy from happening but then i also have to like not kill god like i i don't think he knows like how to stop this from happening because he's obviously gonna have to defend himself Mm -hmm. and his son at some point i think it kind of goes back to him being fearless i spoke about that in the last episode like he doesn't fear anything and one of those things that he doesn't fear is prophecy like maybe maybe it's that he doesn't believe in it because he does think he could go his own path even if he's technically following the path of the prophecy the outcome doesn't have to be the same Mm -hmm. so i think that's why he just continues to fight i don't think he's even giving it much mind to like how can i do this without making the prophecy come true i think he's just like all right well i'll just do whatever i have to do if that falls in line with the prophecy it does if it doesn't i'm paving my own path anyway Either way. And then it's going to create the prophecy. It's going to happen anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I do like, though, how uh, there was just this really quirky remark where they're narrating what Kratos is doing. And they're like, um, something along the lines, like he's trying to not grunt. Uh-huh. But then Kratos grunts and then he's like, and he fails. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah you're you're right like they're reading his personality there is no no timeline where kratos would never not grunt or would he'd always be grunting in any timeline out there especially he doesn't say words much he's always grunting 
Yeah, he's always he's always grunting. Well, we end up leaving the norms and Uro does again reiterate his death prophecy by saying that she enjoyed Kratos' story, but it's a shame that's coming to an end. And it was really interesting how they animated Kratos and Freya walking out. I found it like a bit awkward because they were so close to each other and their facial expressions were very not scared it was just very and not annoyed as well it was more like uncomfortable oh yeah like they were uncomfortable being around the norms and i think that's why we they put uh freya and kratos in the same frame and made it look kind of awkward as they were walking out so we would feel uncomfortable because it's it's you don't i don't know it, it would be uncomfortable if you're hearing from these three i mean the whole scene was uncomfortable for them so i understand why <laughs> Yeah, it worked out really well. I, I enjoyed it. So with that, Kratos is bent on making sure Heimdall doesn't kill Atreus, and we head back to Sindri's. Drop me a... I bloody knew these two had nicked it. And Odin blamed me for it disappearing. They stole Dropnir. We didn't steal nothing. We just ungifted what never should have been gifted in the first place. How will this help me kill Heimdall? Never you mind all that. It's a fucking surprise. We're artists. But to even store Dropnir, you'd need... You were saying... Heimdall's a threat, not only to Atreus, but to everyone. He's Odin's left hand, and he carries the horde that begins Ragnarok. If we have the chance to eliminate him, we and should... And it's just as likely a trap, because the bastard knows your intentions. Kratos... I've never seen anyone so much as lay a finger on him. Not one. Well, I gathered what's fit for gathering. How long will it take? We'll have to go to Svartalfheim to get the rest of the materials. Not to mention we'll have to visit the lady. So we have Dropnir and we have to go to Svartalfheim to get the rest of the material to see the lady. Now... They're talking about the mission and what they need to do. But in this scene, the camera follows Sindri throughout all of this. Yeah. And it makes it seem that there's more to this mission, specifically through Sindri's story. And we hear that Sindri is trying to make it that Brock doesn't go on this mission. So I'm guessing there's probably danger up ahead, but we don't know for sure. But it's just so fun. Like even how cool it was to get the ring from all the, I don't even know how how to explain it. It was like a bajillion rings. It's like a Scrooge McDuck. You know how he has all (laughs) the coins? Yep. That's yeah. That's pretty much like all the stash of like gold and stuff that (laughs) Sindri or material that Sindri has been hoarding at his house. And the drop near seems to multiply like infinitely which is pretty cool cool. device to have so i'm interested in seeing how that actually builds into a weapon i don't even know how exactly but brock and sindri always make some awesome ass weapons so i can't wait to see what the hell they can make so that's it for chapter nine and after this break we're going to be forging destiny in chapter 10 We land in Svartalheim and the micro tunnels, it's like a maze in there. It's you turn right, you think you're going the right way. Oh no, it's a dead end, then you have to go back. <laughs> I was so lost in these tunnels. Again, like I'm enjoying the different settings of this game. Even though we've been to Svartalheim before, we're getting a new a new area. We're getting new new things to see in Svartalheim. So I, I like that aspect of it. Yeah, I do like that aspect of like just getting this new area that we could explore that has lots of crates and explosives and oil on the ground. So you got to be careful not to kill yourself, especially if you're using (laughs) the Blades of Chaos, which I was. And I was like whipping those things everywhere and then like pretty much inflicted burns don't, don't blow yourself up don't blow because yourself of up. the oils yeah. um you're going to encounter a few enemies down there as well and twilight stones that's going to help you get to gates that are closed 
by ricocheting your axe and then opening the gates. We'll also see Sentry again, who pops up and begs us to have him take Brock's place on this mission. So we know that there's something there that's happening. I mean, the best kept secret right now that we know of is that Sindri brought Brock back to life. So yeah. right now I'm guessing that maybe has to do with it, that Sindri's trying to keep that secret, but we don't know for sure. So we're going to have to continue through. You're going to reach a room that has water running through these wooden pipes and you're going to use your Leviathan axe to freeze the pipes and have the water overflow to, again, open some gates ahead. You'll fight some Grims, enter another room with another water puzzle. And all of this is pretty easy peasy, yeah. easy to solve. And from there, you're going to climb your way out of the tunnels and Freya is going to part ways with us while we continue to have Brock lead us through. Really cool to have Brock in our party now because he also has some he has some fighting moves that we can use as well. Yeah, his little like bag of magic. Yeah, whatever that is, or like he like bangs his like instruments together or his, his uh, tools and yeah. stuff happens. And like I just like how he's uh, more outspoken, like in. Like he just, he'll, he'll drop swear words yes. no, no matter what sentence. And we actually hear Kratos talk to Frey about this, that he likes that he's so plain spoken. Yeah. And you know what? I like it too. I like it as well. Nick was right when he mentioned that all of this is pretty familiar because we've been here before when we were looking for Tyr. Um, so yes, again, reiterating what Nick said, it's great to have this different outlook of the area and accessing new places. But we do want to go to the forge, so we follow Brock along the way, and we face off against more Grimms and Nightmares, and then we'll reach a dwarf camp. From there, we'll see that Nightmares have made nests around the dwarf camp and the lift that you need to use in order to go to the forge. So through quickly freezing a geyser, it will help you get to higher ground. And then once you do that, you'll be able to get a better view of all the nests that are around this lift. And you got to just defeat the nest and all the nightmares, which is still, even though it's very basic, it's really satisfying because they are one of the most annoying enemies throughout the whole game because you don't necessarily spot all of them at a time. You'd be mm. looking one way, you see the whole group of nightmares, and then there's one that's popping up behind you because they like do this teleport or like teleport thing where they just appear out of nowhere. I was just annoyed at how much you had to fight and move around. Like It felt like the map was so big just to get to this lift to start working. And for yeah. me, I just kept saying, like, come on, like, I just want this lift. To, like, I just want to get to the next zone. And I felt like I had kept up to fight more nightmares and destroy more nests and then, you know, fix more geysers. And then that geyser turned to this geyser to that geyser. And even though, again, <laughs> like you said, it was relatively easy and simple, I just wanted to get to the lift. And it, sound, it felt like there were so many mechanics in the way to get you to do it first. And I was like, come on, I just want to get on this lift. For sure. And then the funny thing is you get on the lift and then once you get off the lift, you're in another area where you have to take like a separate, like it looks like a lift, but actually like is more like an elevator and it brings you down. But right before you go on that, Brock actually talks to us about the lady, the lady being a magical creature that he's been wanting to meet for some time. But every time he speaks about it, Sindri never wants him to meet her. So he's really excited this time to meet the lady. And when we try to take that elevator to the forge, guess what? The crank's broken. Of course. So we have to gather materials for Brock in order to fix the crank and collect these materials from stones that are nearby. It was just really satisfying to see Kratos use his axe and digging it into these huge rocks and then just taking a piece of the rock to give to Brock. It honestly felt like Minecraft at this point. I uh, <laughs> was just collecting items for Brock and like chiseling, chiseling rocks. <laughs> Yeah, we were farming. Yeah, we were basically farming. We were farming. I'm telling you, this farming simulator, because in farm games, they usually have a mine where you start mining material. Yeah. I'm God of War could do it. Yep. I want it to happen. I would play it. But, 
you know, we're not we're not there yet. So let's just continue on with Kadawa Ragnarok. And we're finally off to see the lady. Ma'am, it would be an honor if you might bless it for us. Are you, uh... Hello? Hello? What the fuck was that? She acts like I weren't even here. Mermaids don't speak to our corporeal bodies. They speak to a part of our soul. A part specifically you might be missing. Damn it, Sindri, you lion's cat scrubber! I knew it. I died. I fucking died! The fuck you want? It needs a blessing. Yeah, well, the one to give us the blessing just fucked off into the tomb! It needs the blessing of a great blacksmith. What? No, no, I can't bless shit. I don't have all my soul bits. It, the blessing wouldn't mean squat. It is the nature of a thing that matters, not its form. All right. So we meet the lady who happens to be a mermaid. And it's interesting that the forge is underwater. I wasn't expecting that um, just because usually when you think forge, it has to there's like heat involved and fire. And how does how would that survive underwater? But no, it's just all through this mermaid who just makes things magically. We see her take the drop near and the spearhead and makes it into drop near spear. Then she adds Kratos's blood and I was like, oh my gosh, in this moment, because as she pricks uh, Kratos's hand and takes some of his blood, it makes his God of War symbol, which is so cool. Like this whole scene is really cool, especially seeing the mermaid and it looks so majestic and then it makes this cool ass spear and I'm trying to think in my head like, oh man, are we going to use a spear? Are we fighting with a spear? So I was excited for that as well, but just that cool nod to Kratos' symbol. Sometimes you forget, you know, that there's a whole other trilogy plus even more games of, you know, the whole Greek mythology stuff. So whenever they kind of show like Easter eggs of that, it makes me happy. It does make me happy. Uh, what doesn't make Brock happy though is that he remembers that he needs to ask the lady for a blessing, but she ignores him and swims away. So Brock's kind of like, WTF, like, what was that all about? And Mimir actually tells us that mermaids don't talk to corporal bodies. They only talk to a part of the soul. Uh, he hints that maybe Brock is missing a part of the soul that she would talk to, yeah. which is why she ignored him at the beginning of their interaction when she holds out the drop near. She doesn't actually grab the drop near from Brock. Kratos grabs the drop near from Brock after the lady like just looks at him. And then Kratos is the one who gives it to the lady. This is crazy because I didn't pick up on that at the very beginning, it was only when Mimir said it that I'm like, oh, crap, it's because Brock's dead. And then Brock finds out he's dead. And oh, what a way to find out. He's alive, but he only has three fourths uh, He's kind of like soul. The Walking Dead. No, he's, is that why he's, again, that, we don't know why that, that's why he's blue. But I, I guess this is a realization of Brock because we hear from Sindri earlier about, you know, his whole, uh, how he saved his life or like didn't give... Only has three fourths of a soul, whatever. But now he comes to that realization that Sindri did this, and it makes me, it makes me like question, not question, but like I'm curious to see where this storyline goes because it really is kind of like a side story, and I, I want to know like what happens with Brock and Sindri in this case. Are they going to go back to fighting again once uh, Brock gets through with Sindri and tells him to you know go f himself basically because he's definitely going to swear. But I'm just more excited about this spear cam, mostly. I'm, I I, I, mean, I yeah. like this storyline, but this spear looks freaking badass. <laughs> You're like, yeah, Brock's dead, whatever. The spear. Yeah. 
<laughs> Give me the weapon. Oh man, I was sad because it was like Brock's Brock was looking to this moment forever. He this was. This is like the once in a lifetime moment for Brock. And it's just taken away from him because his brother didn't tell him that he died and that he brought him back. And this is why Sindri too was saying this whole time, don't take him, don't take him, take me instead. And yeah. then Kratos is like, nah. And then this is, well, we find out why. One thing that really stood out to me in this moment is that Kratos kind of went outside of character here. You know, we rarely see Kratos be really warm hearted and do something that is very sentimental. But he does this here with Brock. He asks Brock to bless the spear because obviously that was what the mermaid i'm gonna just lady say. of the lake yeah the lady of the lake the mermaid yeah she's a mermaid that's what she was supposed to do and because brock being dead obviously could not happen so it was great that you know kratos actually validated brock's worth and the fact that brock means a lot to him just in that moment by asking brock to bless the spear himself because he is such a great blacksmith himself. Not just that, maybe he's a great friend as well. Yeah, I guess um, so. Because I don't I mean he's kind of cool. I don't <laughs> I don't buy the whole I don't know, spear blessing needs to be blessed by the Lady of the Lake in order for it to like, you know, be lucky or something like that. I look at Brock blessing the spear as I don't know, it's like a not you you mentioned sentimental, but it was not necessary, but it's just, it brings it luck, I guess. Mm-hmm. The spear is now lucky because he chose his friend to bless the spear. And it was really a, a moment between the two that we haven't really seen as much. Just like this connection that we've, we, we've kind of seen throughout that Brock really likes Kratos and they're kind of very similar. Uh, they both are men of, of very few words, uh, but they always get the job done. And this was kind of like out of their comfort zone in terms of, bonding together for this moment and it was just fitting mm-hmm. the way it happened and, and, and Kratos saying this and it, it really did get me misty eyed because we don't really see Brock in this light yeah. and I think this was like his victory this was his moment that we haven't seen as much before usually it's all about Sindri in a lot of cases because he's the more talkative one mm-hmm. but this was a Brock victory for sure we got to see more of him and, and play an integral part in this blessing of a spear i like that you did mention like they're kind of both short-spoken um don't really talk about their emotions and you even see that in how brock responds brock was like oh no i'm not gonna bless that level that's my brock impression by the way right that's good and then it was that they both kind of looked at each other and kratos was like just dead face like serious and i think that's one it really resonated with Brock how much their friendship actually means. Um, you know, you have those people in your life where you may not tell them uh, a lot of times how much they mean to you. This was Kratos's moment to tell Brock how much he means. You're going to make me misty eyed again. <laughs> we need to cry. We need a cry break right now. But we do have that sweet spear. And it is sweet. And we get to test it out because as we go back to the way we came, there are monsters there. And let's talk about the spear mechanics because you could throw it an infinite amount of times Uh and then knock your spear to the ground to have those other spears that you've thrown explode. That's my favorite move with the drop near spear. The spear in general is just incredible. It's my new favorite weapon. It's probably the weapon I use the most in this game moving forward. It is inc- like the mechanics are so smooth. You can do everything with it. The special moves are incredible. Like I, I can't like this. When I got the spear, I was like, holy fuck. This spear is incredible. And I just like was so happy at this point in this game because they gave us a new weapon, which I didn't expect at all. And then it turns out to be this monster masterpiece of of mechanics and i was like so excited yeah and it helps you get to like high places as well because if you were going through the game and you noticed that these there were these little holes with wind coming out of them now you could use the sphere to yes. unlock those yes. areas by 
either throwing your spear at those locations and then exploding it or through just throwing your spear and then you could hang off those areas and like jump to another area which is really cool as well finally finally and we really get to test the spear out because we have a couple of ogres to fight along the way and just as we were about to head home this happens imagine my surprise when atreus came knocking at my door he's doing well by the way and will continue to do so just as long as i return to asgard sometime soon that boy of ours is everything I expected. So clever, kind. You sure he's yours? A kid. You really ought to be very proud. He is the key to peace in our age, to break free from all this fate and prophecy. My son is not your key. Oh, God, do they not have metaphor in your homeland? Or rather, did they? I'm sorry, that's not fair. I know you're not the god you once were. And now is your chance to prove it. Return my son, or you may meet the god I once was. And what kind of god is that, Kratos? What do you even know of godhood? In your lifetimes, has anyone ever worshipped you? Ever prayed to you? Can you even imagine that kind of love? No! You don't care about mortals. You don't care about anything beyond yourself. Beyond the monster who kills without cause. You fear what you can never even hope to understand. Is it any wonder that your boy is in no rush to come back to you? Don't listen to him, brother. He's just trying to get in your head. Honestly, when Kratos was like, or you would meet the god I was, I was like, dang! Yeah. Kratos, that is so badass. So Odin and Smee, who I'm just going to call Smee. Durlin, it's not Smee, it's Durlin. I'm going to call him Smee. He's Smee. Yeah. (laughs) They surprise Kratos and there's this conversation with Odin about him pleading to Kratos for peace. He doesn't want war. This is funny to me because when we first met Odin, he said he was only going to offer peace once. And yet we're here again. He's asking for peace. He doesn't want war. Odin is very desperate at this point. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I would say desperate is the word, but why why else would he go? Why else would he go see Kratos? Yeah, I understand maybe to get in his head because he has these conversations about mm-hmm. um Atreus, mm-hmm. but there's no other reason for Odin to see Kratos unless he absolutely has to. Remember, we've talked about how Odin is selfish. Yeah, there, so there, that's if he's selfish, like there's got to be some end game as to why he's coming to see Kratos. Because he's desperate; he doesn't want to die. I don't think it's. I don't think he's seeing that this is leading to Ragnarok. Mm, yeah, I guess maybe he's using his son against him at some point. Like he's trying to like threaten. Oh yeah, Atreus is with me. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe desperation is the right word. I'm not sure what it is, but I just know that this scene was incredibly uh, like the tension you could tell. And, you know, I was expecting maybe a fight here at some point, but. Oh, right. Yeah, actually, yeah. I was expecting a little bit of a scruffle between the two, especially when Odin's like, our, he uses R a lot, our kid. When he's talking to Atreus, like he's taking ownership. He's trying to step in as that father figure and he's trying to make Kratos know that's what he's doing. He really is taunting Kratos a lot. But that's what I'm saying. Like, if he's desperate, then why is he taunting him? That's why I feel like there's something, there's other another layer here. Like, he's trying to antagonize Kratos. It's not that he's afraid. Why is he in taunting him if that's the case? That's my only question. Because I see it as that's what he's holding in his back pocket, right? He knows that he needs Atreus for leverage. Because if he puts mm. Atreus in danger, he knows Kratos will do whatever 
is necessary in order to save Atreus. And that's why he is flaunting the fact that, yeah, I have Atreus with me. Don't worry. He's fine. But he's kind of hinting that he doesn't always have to be fine. Okay. Like okay. he is so close to Odin right now that Odin can manipulate it either way. And he will if Kratos doesn't give him what he wants. Okay, if that this, makes sense. It doesn't come to an end, like the, this kind of leading into a war. And I think that's that's the whole thing. Like he is desperate, but he's using Atreus as that leverage. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Odin also talks about worshiping gods. And we talked about this last episode as well. Having a following. Odin is pretty much trying to say to Kratos, like, how can you say you're a god if you've never understood the love that worshipers could give you? He's really trying to like devalue Kratos's title as the god of war. But that's the same question I had previously, right? Like you do need as a god people to worship you that validates you as who you your status right yeah so does this mean that like because i never actually see kratos as like even though he's so powerful i never actually see him as like a god it, even though i know he's the god of war if i look at it uh, odin is probably just trying to like Again, I'm, I'm, I just keep going back to antagonizing Kratos. Why is he mentioning about his godly titles? But again, like, yeah, he, he was never worshipped because he was always fighting the gods and he basically destroyed all of Greek mythology uh, as we know yeah. it. So mm, I don't know why that matters. Like Kratos never had a shrine. Atreus has a shrine. <laughs> you know what true. I mean? Like, yeah, that's true. I'm starting to question what makes a god now. But what does that matter? That's why, like, I don't understand why Odin is trying to do these things. Because to me, if you antagonize him, that makes him want Ragnarok to happen even more. So that's why it's like, if you're trying to avoid our Ragnarok, why aren't you trying to like be friends with Kratos? I think Odin's doing it because it's, he's saying this because this is how he actually sees Kratos. He doesn't see Kratos as a god. Because Odin's a god. He is the all father. There's a certain, you know, he his ego's kind of stepping in here. There's no way that Kratos in Odin's eyes can compare to him. Good luck. Because buddy, he's then. not he doesn't have that love of worshippers. Good luck. He is he doesn't see him as a god in his <laughs> eyes. All right. Well then Ragnarok's gonna happen. So sorry, Odin. <laughs> Well, after this brief encounter, we reunite with Freya and we take our drop near spear and head back to Sindri's. Have you found a way to reach Asgard? Um, not as such. Had a few ideas, but they didn't so much work. <sighs> Brother, without a way to Asgard, what are we doing? I do not know. I need to think. Well, your father seems very ready to go. Shall we then? So as Kratos goes to sleep, he wakes up and we see Faye again. This time, though, Faye has baby Atreus in hand and the two of them are going on a boat on the lake. Very cute. Very <sighs> sweet moment. Faye along the way explains that this is the woods that they live in. And she mentions that it's beautiful and safe. I guess this is where Kratos's home is. Yeah. I, I guess. Like, I don't think he moved far away from his home. I think this is the same woods that they live in. She is very much focused on that safe aspect. Because she mentions that 
Kratos and her met near the woods that they're at and they almost bit each other's head off. And she also says that Kratos and her have this history, but they're not the people that they used to be, that they could be better. Firstly, every time we have these cutscenes with Faye, I get creeped out just a little bit because she appears out of nowhere. They do it so well, these dream sequences, essentially. But she does talk about this idea of them changing their past or moving forward from their past. So I'm really curious, like all the adventures that Faye was up to before that made her want to seek out this peaceful, safe woods. Yeah, well, first this this cut scene, like I was again, I'm hoping for more information from Faye, but it just seems like memories in terms of like, yes, I know they tried to change their past or like be better, but like I was hoping that we were gonna see we we're gonna hear some more information that we wanted like I don't know, this whole mystery surrounding Faye. I was hoping we were gonna get more out of this scene. Uh, but we didn't. Uh, but that's okay. But to answer your question, I think there's some side quests in Alfheim, if I believe where you go around and you talk to these ghosts and they all tell a story about Thor fighting this woman with an axe and how ferocious this fight was. And we keep hearing about it, whatever. And then we learn, you know, it was Faye and that Faye was like a super intense warrior. So I think both of them, I think that's why they both love each other. And we find out more about their relationship is that they both came from, you know, histories of violence and, and bloodshed and they want to change that and they want to do better with their son and mm-hmm. so it's it's a nice little comforting scene in terms of like now you see their relationship as as to why they got together and why they got married was because they both wanted to change their lives and stay in peace and that's why the woods was protected this whole time and Faye was protecting the woods because they wanted to avoid doing what they did in the past and i feel like as well like you could be a really great heroic warrior But just how she speaks kind of seems like she might have done something she regretted in her past life, Um, whether that was just the violence. But I think it's something a little bit more than that, because her fighting Thor, like everyone hates Thor, whatever. (laughs) You know what I mean? In all the stories that we hear of fate, it's about how she was like for the people. I mean, even as a warrior, I feel like that would be something to be proud of rather than want to leave behind so in my eyes i just feel like maybe there's something there that she did in her past life that she does regret well the the main thing is that the giants are all dead right they fought yeah. a war against odin that failed and she was a part of it so i that's that's what i'm guessing what it could be oh yeah true yeah that's yeah. probably it yeah. you're right that is probably it the other thing we hear which i'm briefly mentioned we must be better mm-hmm. we've heard this so many times before because Kratos says it a lot and that just shows how much he loves Faye to keep those words with him yeah which was a really sweet moment and we also see that you know Faye again is putting this ask on Kratos to make sure that he keeps Atreus safe yeah and I think when we look at this in the last chapter that's really what's going through his mind He can't keep Atreus safe because he doesn't have Atreus. And because of how much love he has for Faye and Atreus, he's kind of, this is the mission that he's unable to complete and that he may fail at. And I think that's where his insecurities come from. Well, I hope he can get to Atreus soon because I don't want him to get warped by Odin. Same here. I hope so as well. And for now, that is the end of chapter 10, but we aren't done yet. Stick around for our final thoughts. The mighty god of war, frightened of his own child. I do not fear our child, Faye. I fear for him. He is innocent. We are not our failures. 
We are not who we were. We must be better. So in this chapter, we again are revisited by the ghost of Faye. I know we spoke about it before, but I wanted to bring up this concept that some people believe. When they start having dreams or visions of people that passed previously, some people feel that may be uh, hinting to your you know, your death because you're able to talk to these people that passed and it's kind of like that you're you're kind of seeing your future because you will be able to talk to everyone that you've loved because you will pass. Do you believe that this may be that as well? Because in the first game, we never saw any visions of Faye. It's only after we learned of this prophecy that you start seeing these memories of Faye. And I, I will say, I don't know if they're completely memories because that first memory oh, or not, vision, whatever 100%. it was, yeah, yeah. was like Faye talking yes. to Kratos. Yeah. I can see it. Like, I, I don't believe it in this case in terms of him seeing his own death. And now he's kind of like reflecting. And that's why he's seeing, you know, Faye and, and the people of his past because he's kind of nearing towards death. I don't think that's the case. For me, it's more of a sense of I think this is Faye's spirit coming to Kratos and trying to remind him to either keep Atreus safe or protect him or, you know, whatever prophecy she had for him or whatever, like just trying to like make something happen. It's not necessarily that she, she thinks Kratos is going to die and maybe she already knows that Kratos is going to die. But I, I really think that this is just her spirit connecting to Kratos to tell him or warn him about something, whatever it is. And we see that in that first cutscene well before in, in the first chapter where she kind of is speaking to him and he wakes up. That's not part of, you know, a dream. It's not, he's not just dreaming about her. There's something of focus here where she's trying to get a point across. I don't know what that is or what that means or if we're going to see something more of it. But, you know, yeah, Kratos could be close to dying, but I more so see this as a spirit of fate just trying to connect with him. Okay, that's fair. I kind of see it as both. Mm-hmm. I feel like it, you know, like how you hear a siren song, that whole the whole mythology behind sirens. Yes, I feel that maybe when you are close to death, that in this or like for Kratos, that maybe he is hearing like the sirens of the afterlife, which come as like people that he knows or that are the people that he knows, like Faye, yeah. and she's trying to make him more at peace with what the prophecy is saying Mm -hmm. by bringing her through these memories to him. I hope they give us more information about this because we really don't know. Uh, Briefly, I want to talk about side quests because there's a lot of side quests that you can do here and they are quite enjoyable. There's a lot of really intense battles. For me, it's the gravestone fights. I kept dying every time I headed into a gravestone fight. Oh, yes, because those, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like a quest line where you put the, the hilt of a sword into the gravestone. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so I, I think I started avoiding them <laughs> at the beginning because I knew I wasn't strong enough. And then when I got to a point that I was really strong, I like destroyed them all pretty easily. But there was a few here at the beginning. I, I don't think I died in this one. I think I did, I did fight it because I think I spent like 30 to 40 minutes and I, I consistently died until I did it because it was like a, a, a point of no, it's like I got to I got to beat this thing. And so it took me a while, but I managed to do it it's specifically in this one. I remember I think it's the Svartalheim one that happens in this chapter that there is a, st- a stone before we talk to either Derlin or Brock or somebody like that. And then um, I fought it. It took me a while, but I beat it. And it is frustrating. These are these are the tough fights. These are basically the Valkyrie fights from 2018. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so if you stumble on a gravestone, and you're wondering what that is, and you already have the hilt, don't go to it unless you have a resurrection stone. <laughs> because that's what I did the first time. And it was very sad to die. And then you get caught up in this moment like, oh, no, I'm not going to find Sindri and Brock to buy a resurrection stone. I'm just going to try to going after this fight because I don't want to take the sleigh any further and just try to beat it without that resurrection stone and then just dying repeatedly until you give up and then decide to buy a resurrection stone. So yeah, very frustrating. 
but also fulfilling as well. A lot of these side quests are actually really, really fun. Oh, yeah. There's there's no not like most of these side quests are all fun to do. I, I enjoyed playing this game thoroughly. Thoroughly. Um, and next time we're going to guess what, Nick, head into more game because we are going in back to Asgard with Atreus. And we don't know yet how he's going to handle the threat of Heimdall because he may not even know that threat is lingering. But we'll have to wait and see if he'll be able to avoid Heimdall's deadly intentions next time on Autosave. Autosave is produced and hosted by Nick Andrade and myself, Camille Selzer Hadaway. The show is also produced by Dylan Wilson. Gameplay and additional elements provided by Chris Dyser. Technical production by Greg Fillion. Executive producer, Clayton Hansler. You can follow the show at Autosave Podcast on Twitter and Autosave Pod on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch. You can subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to it right now. And if it happens to be Apple Podcast, kindly leave us a rating and a review, but only if it's good. Autosave is a Soda original hosted on the Soda Podcast Network. Autosave.